Hello, um, my name is Maximo Cavalsani. I'm the CEO and founder of Edromax, the creator of Sugar Rack or Brown Belt in Spanish, and other titles. Um, we are based in Buenos Aires, and we are 350 there, and 125 here in Montevideo. Hey everyone, I'm Kobe Edelstein from AppNet. Uh, we are an app discovery platform. We uh, have over 60,000 uh, game developers and app developers and website owners uh, using our platform to monetize. Uh, another, app, another side, we help them get discovered. Uh, so we have a self-service platform where they can uh, log in and just start promoting their apps and games. Uh, we flew over from uh, Tel Aviv to meet you for the five of the team here. Uh, Ari Lask, uh, in charge of our game monetization channel, so if you want to talk to him after this meetup, Avi, our VP of Dev, and uh, myself are in charge of advertising stuff. Uh, very nice meeting you. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Yuan from France. Uh, I was working at uh, Ubisoft for many years, and I, uh, I moved to uh, take my own studio, the studio. And uh, the first game we launched in this, in this studio is a mobile game. That's why I switched to console to mobile. It's interesting to see the all the differences with the smartphone. Hello, my name is Federico Romero. I'm one of the founders of Formula Games. Uh, we're a small studio here in Montevideo. There's nine of us at the moment. So far, we launched two games, uh, both on mobile. Uh, first, we launched in 2015 uh, Bullet Boy, which uh, did pretty well. And then we launched uh, Mars Marks this year. Most go and it's a little bit better, I think, for us. So, uh, I'm happy, I'm happy to be Okay, thanks. Okay, before uh, I start, I have some questions prepared. And before we start with that, I'd like to uh, tell you all that it's uh, I do have questions for Colin, but if you guys have any question any at any time you want to talk, just raise your hand, we'll keep you on the mic, and you can definitely shout that out. Uh, that's actually more important than the question. I have a list, but if I cannot go through the list, I'll just think about it. Okay, the first thing is to break the ice. I, I'd like to know, uh, what do you think the next uh, big game genre is going to be? I mean, I know you all want to do different kinds of games, and I'd like to know your take on that. Is there, uh, are we going to see more games the same? As we've seen, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we're seeing uh, like Rock and Roll City, a lot of mashups kind of between different genres. Flavors is one of our uh, uh, best game partners, and what they've done with Garden Escapes and all these titles, pushing up the different game mechanics, uh, with the you know the basic match, the reason the basic game mechanics, and then you start the meta game, and then the garden game. I think we'll see that. I think uh, with more audience getting into uh, the kind of the mid-core genre, where we'll see kind of city builders to come up with the more of the casual the meta game to it. So I think that's some of the things we're going to be seeing. Meshups between genres, a lot of some of the more mid core mechanics coming into a more casual audience. Um, well, I think some technologies are arising like real time, um, and that's because of the, the new networks and the availability of internet around the world. Then uh, I think that during these years we have, we were like harvesting all the different technologies and different <laughs> approaches into games, and I think this year or, or the old if the following years will be the ones that find the, the things that worked in the past and together with the new technologies will bring us the new next generation of mobile games. So I think about real time, I think about clear mechanics like Max Lee, like city building, or all those that worked, and together with the monetization techniques that work, for example, very well for Supercell or different important companies in the world that kind of led the road into what the next generation of games will be. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we have uh, games on the App Store, and every time the more games you see on the market, the harder and harder it gets to get noticed. Um, optimizing the, the App Stores is becoming more and more important. Um, do you do you have you run any A/B testing on your app regarding the, the Google Play uh, page or the, the App Store page? I mean, have you tried 
changing those things and see whether that improves or not. Have you, have you played away with that? No. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, yes, we have a lot because on the on the Google Play Store page, if you go to the notice console, developer console, uh, you can do like any AP test you want with the can be the icon test, can be the banner test, can be the any test you want, the text of the description of the app. Uh, you can test anything and what is new now since like a few weeks ago. They activated this good option that is you can see the, if your app is well in this category. Like for example, uh, the game we are doing is a musical game, so we are in the game music category. And you can see the number, the percentage of people downloading your game when they just visit the page, and compared to the, the other range, of the, what the other games are doing in this category. And, and for us, for example, we discovered that we we were really bad at, at this thing. All in red. It means we have a few downloads compared to the, the usual number of downloads that are, that are due on the page. So that was a surprise for us, but it was good enough for us. We said we have plenty of downloads, that's cool. And then we said, wow, we could have more. So then we changed the banner, we changed the, the icon, we changed everything. And then it uh, improved us. It's so good, thanks to Google. On, on iOS, you don't have this feature. <laughs> So that's cool. That's a very great feature. Um, yeah, we do a lot of uh, A-B testing with, uh, with Google and other tools. One of the things we never did in the past was testing the icon, for example. We, for Premiere Pro, we made like 2,000 versions of the icon, but we still don't know if that was the better. <laughs> and that's, uh, the best one, one that we chose may not be the best uh, for the market. So what we do right now is we do a lot of versions, and then we decide for example, and then we test it. Uh, we apply the same principles to everything we do. Because what we discovered is that at some point discussions end and then the reality is not predictable. So we try to see if the feature is going to change something, but then we go and throw it in, in the world and we do an A-B test. And then we, not only we realize if it worked or not, but how much it worked, how much it worked compared to the, the um, the effort uh, that was, um, I don't know why I'm speaking here, but I'm speaking. <laughs> um, uh, the effort uh, that cost us to make that uh, implementation. So it's basically, it's a good thing to start thinking that way. Uh, what we do is an art, but being scientific is very important. So it's something that you should take into account in everything you do. I think I could add on from the ad platform perspective, we don't see the actual like the store to us. Uh, but we do have uh, a view into what uh, the different big game developers are doing in terms of the creatives on the app. And it's, uh, you have to take into account it's a significant part. So we have like partners like Machine Zone testing over probably over 20,000 creatives a month, which is a crazy amount of work. And some of the things we, we talk to our partners is thinking about the creative is not a static thing. It's, it's a piece you always have feed, you add to feed, and you have to think of ways you can create templates, uh, figure out what works, uh, and, and just iterate all the time, test all the time, and same thing with the monetization. We, we have all the partners who are afraid to try ad monetization, we want to test it, we got to test it, you never know, I mean, I think you use a great example of how we took a, a game that does money both on the paid and in-app versions with ads all together, so uh, testing all the time. A question for you. <laughs> uh, well, we were the biggest, uh, where we really did, did really, really did, really well in 2016. Um, what was your experience, and your experience, uh, regarding them in terms of uh, revenue and user engagement? Uh, so, <coughs> for our first game, we 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 have we were videos for. Uh, Part of our monetization strategy, and it turned it turned out to be what we brought us most uh, most of our income. So for for Mars Mars, which was the second game, we based the whole model uh, only on on robotic videos. That's because uh, the robotic videos allowed us to to do a lot of implementation that wasn't intrusive. Like we, we really didn't like completely. We had these these banner ads uh, with artificial sorry. 
that uh, we felt that they need to hear a lot with their user experience and uh, to order the videos, give us the flexibility to to have the, the users engage with the videos when they wanted to. And personally, or, or at least in, in our two games, but especially on Mars Bars, which I mean, you can actually play the whole game without ever running to, into an app if you don't want to, we saw really high uh, levels of, of engagement and uh, we're really happy with, uh, with having gone down that route. Even uh, a lot of feedback we got from, from, from our players was that, uh, that they, they usually really hate ads in their games because well, I'm sorry, but sometimes a lot of people don't like that, but they, they like our particular implementation of that. And I think rewarded videos is, is, is the, the best way to, to, to offer ads without being intrusive, if that's something you, you care about. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we tried them and we got pretty good results. One of the things um, uh, that you should take into account is that sometimes you think something has an effect and sometimes it doesn't. For example, uh, the guys at Scopely, which is um, a very uh, analytic gaming company that's in San Francisco, they started testing putting more ads to the users, just more ads. Sometimes they put like two interstitions, one next to the other. And they realized that they, it had no effect on retention whatsoever, on engagement or, or anything else. And they were making more money from the user. So make more money from the user means basically more users because you can get users for money. And so if you get a, a higher lifetime value of the user, then your, your game is going to be much more successful. Now, that doesn't mean that any ad will make, uh, won't make any problems in your application, so you have to test. But always rem uh, remember that we call ourselves game developers, but we do different things. The games I do are different from the, the, the ones that they make or Supercell makes. They're different games. Some are more similar than others, but so my advice is test. Test as much as, as, much as you can and realize that it's, it's all about finding that right combination of things that will make your game. Just as a, again, as an ad platform, first of all, we focus on uh, native ads and rewarded videos, so we do things to you. We want to add to the user experience, give them value, not only for our developers. And we've seen a lot of very interesting cases of, of very, very smart game design. Maybe first of all, it's a well-known fact that the user loves it. You know, they're looking for it, and sometimes we've heard developers who, just because someone has a bug, has to remove the rewarded video so they get calls for the support and angry emails, where are the rewarded video? The users love it, and I think if done right, you could also uh, prevent cases where you can improve your conversion for in-app purchase. So some of the interesting examples we've run into with our developers is uh, giving the users a certain point of time in the, in the balance and the progression of the game, when you start slowing down the game and progression, then you gave them a little taste, a little rewarded video of what the in-game currency could do. So it's accelerated, and then they stop again, and then they see higher uh, conversion for paying users. And another very interesting tactic that the guys from Google were talking to us about is basically uh, they were giving out, uh, they were giving out uh, a way to kind of accelerate the game through, through the rewarded video. Uh, and then the people would just zoom through the game, consume a lot of, uh, of their, uh, their currencies, and then after that they'd pay. So, um, I think it's a balance where most users love the, the monetization model, and you can also complement and increase your app purchase uh, revenues. I can just add that it really depends on the country. So, for example, we separate all countries because the behavior of the player is very different. For example, in France, people don't like to buy anything in a, in a mobile game. It should be free. So, you, you will make more money with uh, rewarded ads than uh, in that purchase. So we change the balance, basically we change the balance for the game for country by country. In this country, the, there will be more uh, rewarded ads per day or per Compared to the other country, like in Asia, in, ja in Japan, people are willing to pay in app. So in Japan, you could even remove the rewarded ads because it's, it's polite, it's hard to find the right balance between uh, uh, 
I need a purchase and we are the team ads, so it's, it's called now. And I, I like the idea of having just like rewarded ads. At least you don't have to, you don't have a, a collision into your page. Thanks. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, Jean-Claude, you think, uh, you think was the region of the country that was like harder to crack, harder to get into? So I know you had some amazing experience with China and Bullet Boy. And I talked to you this morning, and she said that uh, it was actually did pretty well in, in Asia. So that's, I thought it was interesting. Yeah. So, well, for us, uh, our main discovery strategy is getting featured by the stores. So uh, we pretty much rely on, well, we do our basic, which is making a game that we think the stores would like, and we, well, we translate it to, uh, to every language that makes sense uh, for us. And then we're pretty much, uh, it's not up to us. So it's not an optimal strategy, I mean, we don't have much, much more control, and basically our, our download rates in different countries go up depending on what kind of feature we're getting a particular week. Like, for instance, this week, uh, for the Latin American store, we, we have been chosen as the second best iPhone game of the year, so that that gave us a, a pretty significant bump in, in Latin American countries. But uh, yes, the, so we're a small team, we don't really uh, get to optimize that much by country by country, we're pretty much uh, yeah, to, the, to, the, to the app store gods. <laughs> For us, it's, uh, it's China first, because China is a big, big uh, market. But it's only on iOS because we have you know, Google Play on in China, so we, we are in the process of getting a publisher in China for Android, so it's for the market. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, uh, except that it's good that iOS is in China, so at least sometimes, suddenly, exactly what you said, you have a featuring in China, because you just see the number of funding, and so what happens, and the server are down. <laughs> And then it's because in China you have a future in It's crazy, the numbers in China, it's not like the rest of the world. It's very different. I think some of the things we're seeing from our perspective is uh, different, different cultural barriers in different markets. So uh, in very unique uh, things we never think of. So let's say in China and Japan, one of the things that we never think in, in the other markets is a lot of people look at the top grossing apps when they're looking at what they download. As you said, they're, they're willing to pay. Uh, so if you have Chinese companies buying distributors in their own games just to be in the top grossing and to get discovered. Uh, another thing that we just had uh, a meetup in the office of Tel Aviv and we had Tomo from, from Mixi talking about Monster Strike and talking about the phenomenon of the, the commute and they're on the, uh, on the subway in the morning. So if the game wants to succeed, that's a lot of the game timing. You have to be able to play with one hand you know, on the subway and access it from the bottom of the, of the screen. So there are also cultural aspects that need to think to know about when you're looking to go into specific markets. Yeah, well, um, for example, for us, it's very, it's very tough to enter the Asian markets, being, we've been number one in every, almost every country in the world apart from Korea, Japan, and China. Um, and we try to understand why, because what we try to do is understand why. Actually, we were very popular in Spain first, then we, we were, became very popular in Latin America, and then we started asking why. Why is, is this game working in Latin America and not in the States? And it seems like a question that you, you won't get any answer from. Uh, but at some point, we realized why, and we became the most successful, the, the most followed application in, in the States in 2015. So, um, different things, some you control, some you don't. But it, it's important to try to ask yourself why. Uh, for example, we know that um, advertising doesn't work really well in, in the Asian markets, and most of our revenue comes from that. Uh, also, the, the social aspects of our games are not quite uh, well seen in, in those other countries. They don't, for example, Japanese guys don't really like to fight each other and, and one of those win, but they, they just want to progress themselves. But it's small different cultural things but when you have such a crowded market with lots of lots of games and millions of games, then the user gets specifically what they like. 
And sometimes watching other players is very important to realize what you are doing wrong. Now, Max, you're saying uh, that the way the game uh, is designed, uh, sometimes it's because, as you said, in your case, it was before you watched and then you realized that. Uh, with, with the last, uh, I don't know, because I think it was this uh, Clash of Clans, we saw that uh, like the recipe for success was, okay, you have to decide the monetization first and then just throw a game on top of that. Uh, do you think, either if it's in your games or it's the most common thing, do you think that uh, games are mainly uh, designed around monetization and the kind of virality, or we're just making games? <coughs> I think uh, a lot of them are. A lot of them are just uh, basically taking the recipe from another game and putting their own game on top of it without uh, like just trying to copy what's working. I mean, well, you, you mentioned Clash of Clans. And there are a lot of Clash of Clans clo clones that I think uh, they started by, by thinking that. I mean, you want to make a game that makes as much money as Clash of Clans or well, and it doesn't have to that. Uh, but I, I definitely think that there, there's also Sometimes that uh, I do think that that games that that, that have monetization first in mind uh, work best in, the, in in terms of revenue. But I, I also think there are a lot of games that that were uh, monetization is an afterthought. It it probably shows in terms of revenue, uh, but it I mean it adds to the buyer to the I mean there's a little bit of everything. I think, it's just, you know, I think it's a mistake to think that way. It's too simple. Like, do the monetization and then do a game. It's just one thing. It's not two things. So, and I think what is more, mostly uh, more important is what you said is now uh, how people are playing your game. And basically, in Asia, in China, they want a game that you play with one finger on one hand, and on the vertical side, not the horizontal one. That was not good for our game. At least now, you know what they want, and you will see a uh, close day Mario, it is exactly this. Mario, vertical Mario, with one finger. So, it's, this is, what is more important, I think, is the usage, like how people will play it, and the, the, what we call the gameplay loop. Is it uh, five minutes? In five minutes, can you play something and uh, have a reward? Or is it a loop that is like 15 minute loop? And then it's too long for mobile. Mobile is a very short loop. You want to play it like this, like Angry Bird, like that's it. Then you, you, you need to have a, a big reward in, in this loop. So this is, I think it's more considering the, how people play your game instead of how you're going to make money. Uh, um, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer, but it's it's like making a movie. You cannot say that the story is of, is the movie, that the actors is the movie, that the director is the movie. It's a, it's a mixture of things, but what you do have is best practices. You have many paths uh, for your game to not, not be successful. You don't have a path for it to be successful, but you have many paths for it to not to be successful. Uh, one of the things I realized, for example, is that our economies were very bad. I mean, we made money with, uh, with advertising, but our economies were bad. So I spent all this year studying all the economies of all the important games in the industry, and then realized that we were making a lot of mistakes. That we won't, we weren't uh, making money from in purchases or as much money as other players because we were making mistakes. We were doing things that the industry knows they are not okay. Popping a game, clones don't, don't work because because of how the industry works. If you get a clone of Clash Royale, for example, you will be uh, all the, the users will go to Clash Royale for a, for a or less money, and so they will be able to acquire and they will destroy you. But learning from how Supercell uh, perfects their economies, or Machine Zone, or other games, it's a very, uh, it, it's something that pays a lot when you're a developer. And it's just a part, I mean, the economy is very important, then user interface is very, is very important, localization is very important. Um, graphics are very important, the icon is very important, the name is very important. So what you have is different best practices for all those things and a thousand more, and the best work you make, 
mixing all those things in a work of art, which is a game, and a little bit of luck, then you get a, a successful game. I think that's the only way, and the way of achieving that is trying to see where you are standing in terms of everything, and where are the best players in the industry, and how do I make a step towards that. Uh, so for us, it was, for example, I think the best economies are made by Supercell. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to copy their economies, but you have to understand why they're the best economies in the world. Uh, if you think about uh, casual mechanics, I think King is the king. <laughs> so um, just try to see why they're better than you at that, that different, uh, those different aspects, and then you'll have a better chance of having a successful game. And then you have to try it out. I think just one point to add is that if uh, you are successful and have a great game with a big user, a loyal user base, uh, then adding in uh, ad monetization is not very hard. I mean, we have some examples of game developers with uh, half a million dollars, a million dollars. They don't know what do we do? We did those kind of closed loops around rewarded videos or the different types of ads, and, and we found a, we found the users that usually. Because they're loyal and they love the game, they, they, they play around. They will, so even if the rewarded video doesn't get to something very crucial and not baked in the stack and take money in the progression of the game, they, they will do it, they consume it, they like it, and it's their way to show kind of love for the game. So uh, if you're lucky enough to have a great game with no monetization scheme, putting in a rewarded video will work for after a while as well. Something else that I wanted to uh, maybe talk about is when, when do you know when a user is not going to pay anything? I mean, how, how long do you try and when do you just give up in terms of uh, having a player actually give them anything? Uh, whatever you do, you have to try. Uh, basically, you don't do a lot of segmentation uh, regarding users. The only thing you do is you adjust how many ads you show, depending on how, man, how much they are engaging with the ads. But uh, other than that, we, we don't really do it. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's a, if you really want to segment the players like this, it requires uh, at least one full-time person in the analytics. And uh, when you are supposed to do, you, you cannot or you don't want to dedicate one person to this. You prefer to think about the next game or something else like on this. Can be like the, it can be a trap. Mobile game can be because you put all those analytics, those tracking, and then you have all those numbers, and it can take a lot of time for sometimes everybody in the team wants to know like exactly what happens in the game, and it takes a lot of time. And for small companies, it's, it's also a risk to be stuck on your first game, for example, because it works. So you analyze, you start to tweak it to make more money, and then after a few months, you say, okay, but we didn't think about the next game, so. Maybe you uh, should change uh, what you want. I can say from my perspective that um, one of the nice things about a platform is to fully transparent. You can post, put, post it and um, post maps to see exactly what people are doing within the, uh, the game. And a big percent of our developers are looking to get ROI after three days. So they're looking uh, to see a first purchase and, and three days and see what their ROI is then. I can't see if you're, if you're a small studio, uh, you don't have to have the most advanced uh, statistics at home. I mean, there's services now that like software as a service will give you uh, predictions uh, based on your data, uh, could give you uh, even your trade back and your ad revenue, like services like Zoom have to admit again. So you could also know on a user level uh, how much you're making per ad run or per ad purchase. So you don't have to have all the science in house. You should start using that. Uh, well, we, we started as a non-analytics company. We actually we didn't make any user acquisition, actually, and had more than 200 million downloads. But then we realized that it, it's a good thing to focus on the game, right? Making new games. But then when you, when you start being bigger and you start uh, being able to, to watch the numbers, because having numbers, it's, it's worthless. I mean, numbers are, are as good as the people looking at them. So if you start building the teams that are looking how to make something more engaging or, or finding if, if a user is going to be a paying user. For example, right now we have a 
six, six people in an artificial intelligence lab in Netherrax just trying to understand the user. And we are using neural networks and different stuff. We, we couldn't even think about that three years uh, ago. Uh, and now it pays for us because small improvements are a lot of money and we have people already thinking about the games. But it's, it's a process. You cannot do everything at once. If you are three people in a, in, a, in a garage making a game and you expect them to realize which is the percentage of buyers they'll have after three days, it won't happen. And if you try to do that, you will lose profit from what you're doing. So uh, try to, again, it's, it's try to build the steps towards being something big. If you want to be something big, and, and if not, try to stick to the simple things. I mean, trying to have a good game, trying to understand the basics of a good economy, uh, the basics of things that will make people more likely to buy, uh, but then having all that small uh, information, and inside information, not just for big companies or, or mid-sized companies. So it depends on, on where you stand. Okay, do you have any questions? I still have some more. I would like to know if any of you have any questions. What about the mechanics? Uh, Sorry? What about the mechanics on the game? Or what do you, where can you measure whether a mechanic, not, not also the monetization and where you focus the monetization, but let's say a new mechanic on the game. Uh, how can you measure whether the time you invest in a mechanic is going to pay on a user? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't really know how to measure that on a, on a mechanic or a feature based level. So, like, well, um, a lot of what Max was saying in the answer before applies to us at, at this moment. So, for Bullet we've had a lot of analytics, like, we added tracking for the different kind of events. But then, uh, going through the data, it's, it's, it's a huge amount of work. It's not only, I mean, you need time and you need to know. I mean, it's easy to look at the data where you're trying to find something and then finding it because actually you're like, you're, you're reading the data in a, in a way you want to. So you have two, two different people come, coming from different hypotheses to, to look at the same data and they all, they all like, they validate their own assumptions just because, I mean, no, they don't really know how to do it. So I think like what you asked now and uh, the previous, version, uh, previous question, you really need uh, to, to have, a, to have a, lot, a lot of resources in order to, to, make, uh, to make use of information <coughs> from analytics. I mean, it's easy to track things, but it's really hard to, 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 yeah, to, to get uh, useful information out of it. You, you were speaking about like, gameplay and mechanics? Right. But for us, uh, but it's different uh, in each studio. We we don't go to we don't launch the game until we are sure we play test the mechanics at a very small level with a few people every week. So, or you can soft launch in one country. You can also soft launch or make a beta. Now you can make a beta state on Google Play. So, but it depends on the, the pipeline you have, the way you you like to work. So for us, it's every week we we play test. The new things, and we see uh, how people react as soon as they play this game. I think again, there's a platform that could help you in the game build and A/B testing. The problem is uh, analyzing after you've uh, released it. If it's not A/B tested, it's very hard to find stuff to look at. But you can use uh, Delta DNA and actually up to the level of a specific parameter to teach you like speed of a character. You can do A/B testing and see the impact on. Uh, Engagement, retention, monetization. Um, it's a difficult thing to do. We started doing what I'm going to tell you now just this year. Uh, but it pays. Again, you need to be a quite a sized company or, or just be good at that. But let's say if you have to try to think about dimension, for example, a mechanic. If, if a mechanic has a single dimension, So, um, <laughs> I broke it. Me. I broke it. So, um, if you if you reach a point where you understand that a mechanic is going to be good into a one or few dimensions, let's say a mechanic at the speed of a, a character, for example, if 
right? It's just one dimension. It's from zero to infinity. But you know it's going to be between two and eight. Then you can make an A, B, A, B, C, D, E, F test. The problem is if you start adding dimensions, then you have to test all the combinations. So the art here is to, and, and that's something you see very, very well when you build an economy. Um, so when you're building an economy, you need to try to to build it so that you can tune it up, uh, in, in, and, it, and you can understand what you're touching. If you touch something here and it changes everything, then you can. But it's the same if it's a mechanic. Let's say you you, you at the start of the year we we, we published um, a feature in Canada which was like a Tinder for Twitter crack, and we thought it was going to be huge. It was going to be the, the thing in 2016, and it really did work. I mean, we tested in Canada. We we test users with it, users without it, and we we measured their retention, we measured their engagement. It was like no change at all. It was. It also made it the interface more confusing. But more than that, if we had realized about that, then we, we could have said, "Hey, let's do it better or whatever." So it's important to know if and how much if something works. Uh, it's difficult, so you have to. The, the real key here is choose your battles. If I had infinite time, I can assure you, you I can make you um, a success. Right, but you don't have infinite time, so it's how you use that time, and it will depend, of course, on the abilities of your team. If you're very good at metrics, then spending time on metrics might be a good idea. But if you're very bad at metrics, then you're just wasting your time. Some of you are developers, so when you when you have a problem uh, uh, in your code, what do you do? First, how do you find that line of code that's breaking everything? You strike. You, you try to trap it, right? Try to put uh, logs or whatever, you trap that line of code. So here's the same. If you want, want to find that golden number in, in, in a dimension or two dimensions, you have to trap it. You have to say, hey, it's not going to be more than this, it's not going to be less than that, and then try to find the right number. Okay, we have uh, time only for one more question. Anyone? Yeah? We all know, we all are aware about the great trend of digital reality and augmented reality. The industry is pushing for the next year. Uh, the companies are promoting such a great initiative like Microsoft, uh, Tesla uh, Design. You will explain with this uh, digital phone, with this uh, staging specifications. And it sounds good, but from the developer point of view, how do you uh, see that change will come? How, how fast or not will be it be adopted by game design? Okay, so this year we've seen like uh, not a virtual reality, but augmented reality. We've seen like. Uh, it seemed like uh, with uh, Pokemon Go, like uh, had a huge hit. So it's it's hard to know whether that was because of the augmented reality or just Pokemon launching on mobile. Uh, from I think that those kind of hits will probably encourage a lot of uh, a lot of people that uh, that might have been considering doing stuff like AR to to go for it. For, for VR, I think it's a little more complicated. Uh, I mean, from a developer, from a developer's point of view, personally, I mean, we, we consider it. Uh, I, I just think for us, for instance, it doesn't make much sense at the moment because there's not really a big market there. To, like, it's really green. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. A lot of studios have different opinion on, on this. Uh, for us, it's a bit the same thing. We think that it's, it's not yet there. Uh, the market is not there. There is a big uh, hype around it, but still, uh, there was a big hype around uh, what the, the Wii Fit, those kind of things, and you put it in your closet after playing once. So I want to make sure it's not a gadget. It could turn to be a gadget. So let's see uh, 
avec deux années qui sait que le market est trop so small, il n'y a pas de market pour nous. So, it depends on the strategy of your studio, but uh, and the, the investors you could have also who want to do VR or not. But uh, in our case, same thing is not yet there, so we're not uh, bet betting on this.